Arua, uh, who's uh, research chair in global women issues uh, here at Western in the Women Studies. Uh, and I'd like to especially thank her to be with us <laughs> today because uh, she's on tonight. She <laughs> come here and talk in her own institution, so this is great. We're very happy that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me to do this, and thanks to uh, Rotman Institute for organizing this speaker series. I feel as if I do a lot of speaking, but rarely at Western, which I think a lot of us find that to be the case, right? That we're rarely actually giving talks in our home institution. So thanks very much. Um, I see a few people I've had in my classes as well, which is very nice. Uh, gender justice change, um, gender and the environment, so anyway. It's good to see uh, students. And thank you for, for coming out on a Friday afternoon. I feel a bit guilty about all the Friday afternoons on which I didn't go to, to things now. <laughs> anyway, I promise to do better in the future. Um, so as some of you probably know, most of my research is what I would consider at the intersections of um, environment, economy, and equity. So basically, the big questions I've always asked in my research are, how do we reconcile economic security with environmental protection, and also gender equity and social justice. So that's the dilemma, or rather the trilemma, I think, that um, I've been contending with for most of my academic career. I also spend a lot of time outside of academia, so I'm not, I'm kind of one of those people who I think I've grown to be comfortable with the fact that I spend a lot of time outside academia, and that's great, but I don't feel very comfortable in any setting, really. I have to be honest about that, so I find that Often in academic settings, I think that I'm kind of a reluctant academic, uh, and I kind of wish I were doing something else. And then often I'll be in practitioner settings or in policy settings, and I'll become like this, you know, intensely academic and think, they need more conceptual engagement with these issues. This is really troubling. You know, I, I can do this for them. So at, in the early years of my career, I have to admit, I tried very hard to fit in. I tried very hard to fit myself into one or the other. But then at some point, uh, possibly after I got tenure, after I realized that it's OK to actually not be comfortable anywhere, that I decided that I was going to welcome that discomfort and try and make meaningful contributions in as many spaces as I can. So that's my brand, as it were. Um, so um, I'm on sabbatical this year. And um, again, I'm spending a lot of time. I'm spending time with Global Affairs Canada, doing a lot of knowledge translation based on my research. I'm spending time with the International Renewable Energy Agency and the International Energy Agency as well. Uh, again, doing knowledge translation on actually this research, which is a, it's a big piece. I'll try and share some broad strokes today, OK? And we'll hopefully have a meaningful conversation. So about six years ago, I became very interested in the topic of what will happen for work and for employment as we move out of fossil fuels. So this was the time, if you remember, in the past 10 years when the broad conversation about sustainability, about kind of climate change was really entering the consciousness in environmental circles and economic circles. And we started hearing about the global transition out of fossil fuels. It's hard to be upset at that. I was very happy to hear that we are you know, going to be leaving fossil fuels behind and we're moving into this bright, bold new future based on, for example, renewable energy. We're going to move into this low carbon e economy and future. We're going to move into a green economy. So all these words were being thrown about. And I became very interested in kind of trying to understand the nuts and bolts. And, and being trained as in kind of in, in a very empirical tradition, you know, I want data, I want to look at trends, I want to look at patterns, that kind of a thing. Um, so I remember looking at all the documents that came out of the Rio Plus 20 conference, the UN conference in 2012, which was the 20th anniversary of the first Rio conference, which was in 1992. And I've lived on long enough that I remember 1992 and being very excited about it. Was a university student at the time, very excited. And it was what actually shaped my career, right? So I wanted to do these things. I was very interested in sustainability, very interested in development, in gender equity. So all, it seemed to bring together all those pieces. And I think many of us who chose interdisciplinary careers at that point, perhaps very foolishly in hindsight, um, were very, very moved by that moment in time in the early 90s at the promise of Rio, as it were, right? So 
20 years go by and 20, 1992 goes by and then you know 2002 and then to, uh, 2012 comes around. And I tried to look at the Rio documents and I realized that they were very utopian. I would say the documents said things like, in a low carbon economy, you know, social justice will prevail. Well, wonderful, and I'm very happy, but can I see some details, right? So that's kind of how I am. So I said, I want to see what kinds of programs we're talking about. In low carbon futures, you know, employment will be fair and just. Well, exactly how, right? So I kept start asking these questions and found that I wasn't finding much by way of evaluation. What I was finding was descriptions of things that were being tried around the world, innovations, very interesting, but not necessarily, but they were cataloging stuff, right? They weren't really telling us how are things getting better, right? You know, or are they getting better? What are the nuts and bolts? At that time, actually the same year, I was invited to a conference in, in, um, in Toronto, and it was called Work in a Warming World. This was a very big conference organized by York University. They had had this big grant, short grant, and it was about what will happen to work in the context of climate change. And Blue Green Canada, which is this Canadian alliance that talks a lot about the transition to low carbon. And I like their work, by the way, right? They you know, basically introduced this campaign there where they're telling Canadians about the number of jobs that will be introduced. You know, very convincing, one million in oil and gas, you get two jobs, and in clean energy, you get 15 jobs. Now, um, being kind of the party pooper I am, I guess, um, I asked questions like, how much will these jobs pay? Will they have pensions and benefits? And who will get these jobs? And the gentleman who was very earnestly presenting this, this campaign, and you know, this does the rounds of Facebook, like I've received it multiple times on my feed. Um, he was quite frustrated with me, I could tell, and a little bit impatient. And he said, this is public communication and public messages have to be simple. And I thought, okay, you know, okay, fair enough, but it still didn't answer my question because I was curious about these 15 jobs. If they're gonna be jobs that are precarious, that have no security, if they're gonna be jobs that have no pensions and benefits, then are we really better off, you know, getting rid of, you know, basically two very well-paid jobs in the oil and gas sector, which we all know about. Um, you know, is it really necessarily better for purposes of you know, equity or social justice, right? So those were the questions I started answering. And one thing that became very clear to me was that he wasn't trying to actually brush off my question. Frankly, the evidence doesn't exist because people weren't doing research on this topic at the time. So I kind of just said, okay, well, it looks like I'm gonna have to start my own research on, on this topic. So at that point, that's what I did. It started a research project. Over time, it's been funded now very well, I have to say, by a lot of different organizations. But at the time, it was with a, with a small grant just trying to understand what exactly we we're talking about in the context of a global shift to renewable energy, what kinds of jobs, who will get them, what kinds of pay scales. Obviously, given my interest in gender equity and social justice, I'm very interested to know who is going to get these jobs, right? So a little bit of a summary. Um, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, was formed very recently, actually, just about, I think, about 10 years ago. And their mandate, it's, a U, it's not a UN organization, but it's exactly like a UN organization. So you have to be a member country. And once you are, you pay your membership dues. What they do is collect data, analyze it, tell you about trends, and help countries build their capacity for transitioning to renewable energy, okay? So this is IRENA's latest forecast. And they basically said in 2017, 10.3 million jobs were created. Um, big source of employment globally. And this is 5.3% before the previous for the previous year. So in one year, we are seeing that kind of growth. 43% of all renewable energy jobs are in China. I think this is predictable. Uh, a lot in the solar industry. And the bottom one is very interesting because even in the time since in five years, the number of jobs has, you know, increased by 1.5 times. So we're talking about very very rapid growth around the world. So these are not sectors of employment that we can ignore and say, "Hey, you know, it's not going to be that much employment." So we do have to pay serious attention to them, right? Um, Canada actually just joined IRENA. Um, it's funny; for the longest time, they held out because the Conservative government, during the 10 years, kind of said, "There's no need for us to be joining this another international organization." You know, you know the usual arguments. So it, this year, actually, finally, uh, Canada has become a member country of IRENA, which I was very pleased to hear. If you look again at job creation, um, one thing about IRENA is that they distinguish between the 10.3 includes large hydropower, which is very controversial for a lot of reasons. Hydropower has had, you know, obviously you've all heard about dams, you've heard about displacement, the kinds of things 
uh, effects they have upon rural populations, indigenous peoples, right? So for that reason, what they do, but hydropower is renewable, right? So they do include the measure, but if you look at that 8.8, .8, it'll include small hydropower, so small rivers, those kinds of projects, but they do also tell you how many jobs are created in large hydropower in their projects, okay? Uh, so that's the breakup. And if you look at it, you can tell, right, that China is obviously a huge player, which is very interesting considering China is also exploring coal, right? So one of the things to keep in mind, I think, is that a lot of people have the idea that the transition out of fossil fuels to renewables is linear, right? You go from fossil fuels to essentially to clean. That's not how it works. It's often two steps forward, three steps back, or people tend to use a lot of different sources of energy uh, going forward. So that's kind of what the map looks like. So in this time, in my research, I started looking at comparative research and knowledge synthesis. And I had to organize my data in some meaningful way. So I look at it along the lines of industrialized countries, OECD countries. Then I look at emerging economies. So those are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And then I look at quote unquote developing countries. Now I'm very aware of how fuzzy these categories are. But I had to figure out some way of organizing my data. So those are the terms that I, you know, so I do classify how I use those terms. Um, my empirical work, the primary research is in India and in Canada. So I've done work in India and Canada. Both one is an emerging economy with a huge, potent, you know, obviously a hugely growing renewable energy market. Um, and Canada, obviously, it makes sense to do comparative work. There's also been a lot of demand for this work in Canada. So there were grants where they asked specifically for this research. So I tried to meet that demand as well. And it's a very interesting area. So today I'll share some broad strokes from these findings. And some of my findings are very counterintuitive. So I hope that we can have an interesting discussion about it. Okay. So if we look at OECD countries, those are some of the countries that I've looked at. Um, so I, you know, Canada, US, Spain, Germany, Italy. I've also looked at Baltic countries, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. I find them very interesting because these countries, if you remember, left the Soviet er uni Union very early. They were the earliest countries to actually leave the Soviet Union and join the EU. So um, some findings from those countries are very interesting. So when we look at this, one of the biggest challenges for me with doing this research initially was that jobs in renewable energy, they tend to be distributed along the value chain. So you have jobs in manufacturing, you have jobs in construction, you have jobs in installation in fuel processing, you have jobs in operations and maintenance, and then you have obviously jobs in policy, you have all, so you have them in many different domains, but there isn't anything where you can go and look at national statistics on renewable energy, right? So it's not like I can say, give me national statistics for jobs in renewable energy in Canada, it doesn't exist, right? You have to parse it out of a lot of other data sets. So this meant that I had to take what I call, and I, you know, uh, I don't put, it, put this down on grant applications because I won't get any money, but uh, I call it like a vacuum cleaner methodology, basically, right? Like I had to take what I could find, and I'm being completely honest about it, because um, you try and you know, figure out the reliability of the data, and then you take what you can and you analyze it, right? Uh, like I said, obviously I don't write it up using that, that terminology in my grant applications. But that is what it amounts to initially when you're getting a new area of research, because there isn't a body of knowledge to draw upon. There are related fields that you can draw upon, but not. So when I started looking at these countries initially, even with those limitations, it became very obvious that even in industrialized countries, women actually hold a minority of jobs in the energy industry in general. The energy industry, the traditional one, oil and gas, was notoriously gender unbalanced. I think people know that, right? That it was actually in implicitly or explicitly for a long time women were denied opportunities, at least the most well-paid and meaning, you know, uh, technical jobs in those fields. Um, so when we look at these countries, we find that overwhelmingly women are employed in non-technical occupations, administration, public relations, kind of very predictable areas, right? We see the lowest representation in technical fields, engineering, and in as we move up management, we see you know, the numbers go down, they, they just keep dropping off. Um, in terms of the greatest representation of women in OECD countries, we see the women, generally the biggest area is in sales, it's predictable, sales and retail, followed by administrative positions, and then finally, you know, we see engineers and technicians being the lowest numbers, okay? Some of this is, of course, related to um, sort of the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields, and this we've all heard quite a bit about in the last little while. And there's an obvious economic benefit to choose the, choosing these careers, 
But wage inequality also exists in STEM jobs. So a lot of people say, you know, you can go into STEM careers and you won't experience, you know, the gender wage inequity. It's not true. It also exists in STEM jobs. It's just smaller than in what it is in other fields, right? So give you an example. The Nature Conservancy in the U.S. tried to calculate the gender wage gap, and they thought that in STEM fields it was about 14% between men and women. In other fields, it's still 20, 25%, right? So it's kind of, and there are way fewer women. So when you kind of to describe it as a scenario, it's kind of like glass half empty and glass half full, right? So we see that women uh, generally have um, higher you know, wages than in other sectors, albeit not equal with, with men, uh, but you have smaller numbers of women in these fields, right? The research gets really interesting when you start looking at higher up levels, when you start looking at senior management and boards of companies. That's when it gets actually really depressing, some of the findings from OECD countries. I'll use this example because it's too good not to share. So publicly traded energy companies in Canada have, I didn't do up the image or I wouldn't choose pink for women, but anyway, uh, just to give you an example, but this is how it was defined. So 93.9% .9 of people in Canada on public, in, these are publicly traded energy companies, not just renewables, but publicly traded, are men, and 6.1% are women. Now it gets even funnier. Of that 93.9%, 11.9% are men called David, John, or Robert for their first names, right? So with no disrespect to men called David, I think they're perfectly good names, but it tells you it tells you that there are actually twice as many men called David, John, and Robert for first names than there are women, right? To give you a sense of the type of disparity we're talking about. I did a project earlier this uh, year with uh, Natural Resources Canada, and we looked at energy mining and forestry broadly, and the forestry companies were really quite atrocious as well. Some of it was quite shocking for me to see. Um, so never mind talking about you know, uh, ethnic diversity, never mind anything else. You know, even when we just look at what they look like, essentially the boards are still remain almost exclusively white and male in these industries. Okay. Um, now moving on, I also did a fair bit of work, obviously looking at emerging economies. BRICS is an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, so big emerging economies, and like I said, you know, loosely classified. Uh, developing countries. Um, so what, what became very quickly obvious is that renewable energy deployment is growing very globally um, as a very sustainable and increasingly economically viable alternative to con conventional sources of energy. Um, there's also like increasing recognition of the fact that these are fields in which there is a lot of employment to be had. But if you start looking specifically at analytical work and empirical evidence, uh, it's very, very limited. And the problem is a lot of data sets are not reliable at all, or they're very spotty. So I'm trying to do this research. They're just huge gaps, right? So one of the things I try and tell my students is, if you want to do research like this, there's a lot of value in it, because not very many people are doing it, right? Like today, in the six years since I started this research, I get called on for anything on this topic. I'm called for it, right? So it's not that difficult to build, as it were, an expertise in the topic, because there's so little to begin with. Uh, but it's hard because it's, there's very little evidence to go on. So you really have to be creative about how you collect and analyze data. So what I did find is that obviously with having very spotty data, it's very difficult to collect and analyze data. Uh, so one of the things, the other thing that is very complicates this looking at this issue in a global context is that we get very different numbers if we include or exclude large hydropower. That's a big one. Um, and if we include or exclude informal employment, because informal employment is employment, right? So if we include informal employment in renewable energy, so women who produce traditional biomass, who, for example, who grow trees, who cut trees, who produce charcoal, these are huge industries, right? If we look at other things like if women who grow fuel crops, things that are grown for fuel, so that becomes then, you know, we have very different, because not all renewable energy is clean, right? All, most, not, rather not all renewables are clean, but all cleans are renewables, typically. Does that make sense? OK. So in terms of how institutions classify them as well, there are complications. So like I mentioned, International Renewable Energy Agency does not consider nuclear green or clean, with good reason. The International Energy Agency, though, which is an OECD organization, they do consider nuclear clean. right? And that's something I've been asked again and again, like, is nuclear clean? No, not in my definition, because when things go wrong, they do go really horribly wrong. right? 
So um, one of the very interesting things that I listened to once in the panel was that if you remember the recently the Fukushima, you know, the the the, the uh, Japan story with what happened with the that whole site will be unusable for the next couple of hundred years, and the only site that it only use that it is being put to now is installations of solar panels. So there's a very ironic story there, right? Uh, so I found that you know just just yeah, it's just something to take away and think of. Um, so there are no national data sets we've been able to use, but what I found some very interesting things. If we know, for example, today that 50, more than 50% of Sub-Saharan Africa's agricultural workforce are women, more than 50%, right? So if you think about the similarities between those activities, say agriculture and charcoal production, we know that the numbers are enormous. Some of the estimates I've looked at are 13 million, 15 million, so I get very, very big numbers. What I do have, it's very difficult to get good numbers about it, but we, what we can do is get a sense of still what the challenges and opportunities are, right? Uh, one thing that we can find a lot of interesting data on now are some of these projects. Solar Sister, which is now an enormously popular in different Sub-Saharan African countries, where women basically, they, they, um, they, they basically retail these solar kits, right? So they sell, uh, you can sell a home system, a home uh, solar system, you can repair, you can maintain. So there's a lot of employment that's been generated in these fields, there's no question about it. There's the Barefoot College in India. It's kind of, it's ironic and, you know, it's, it's existed for a long time, so the name has been around for a long time. It's called the Barefoot College because they train, you know, essentially rural populations, you know, and especially women often are very, very active in learning how to, uh, try, you know, basically introduce solar, not so much wind, but mostly solar in India, and a lot of biomass as well, a lot of biomass projects, biofuel. So that's something that, you know, I know a lot about, we can talk more about it later. One of the things that I'm finding though is that a lot of the data on this field exists on projects like this, right? So where you're looking at these distributed off-grid type projects where women are maintaining uh, technology and selling it, that kind of thing. What we're not finding much data on, and you know, ho hopefully there will be more research done on it, are these large scale infrastructure projects because now we have these huge land grabs, for example, in many parts of the world, in Asia and in, in definitely in Sub-Saharan Africa, where land is being acquired for monocropping often of these fuel crops, right? And there, I think that's where the really thorny issues for women often come up because if you're acquiring land to do these things, then immediately there are issues with land rights, which are very weak for women to begin with, right? Uh, Compensation, who are you going to pay compensation to? Who's going to lose employment? Are you only going to consider formal employment? Because most women in any case work in informal economies, right? So these are all really important issues that I think we'll have to think about in a lot of depth, and we'll have to produce a lot of evidence on it in the future. So I see them growing. Um, with doing this research, one of the areas that very early it was, you know, we had to do research on it was the big debate about food versus fuel, which I'm sure many of you have encountered, you know, the idea that we are now increasingly acquiring uh, what are essentially uh, food crops, right, right, like corn, but now because of industrial agriculture, a much more lucrative use of that resource has become as fuel, right? There was a whole, um, there was a very funny uh, article someone once wrote called Surviving Whole Foods, and it's really, really funny about this whole you know, the way that green is being sold to us now, right? As being more productive, buy green, buy everything green, essentially. Consume more, but just buy green, right? That seems to be the message. And, uh, and, she, and there was a part where she said, well, you wouldn't know it. You know, the guy was driving a hybrid, so he practically ran over a pregnant woman. But, I mean, he's driving a hybrid vehicle, so I guess that's okay, right? So these contradictions about really bad behavior where you can hide behind your green consumption, I thought it made a good, I thought it made a good point. So we're seeing a lot of this, and this was very early, we started looking at it. And definitely uh, fuel crops, one of the big issues was, have you heard of Jatropha, the fuel crop Jatropha, anyone? Okay, so this is a crop that is grown traditionally in many parts of the world. So India, Cambodia, Mexico, for example, many, many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, they've been growing Jatropha for a long time. It's a tree that produces an, a seed that has this oil that can be burned and it's a source of energy. And people have used it. They've also grown it as part of food systems, right? 
So, um, you know, this was picked up early on by a lot of scientists, and they were like, this is a miracle solution, because Jatropat, one of the things that with the tree is that it can grow even in very salty soil, even in very sandy soil, so it can grow in dry sand soil with very little water. And so people got very excited about it. So with this, we don't have to have the food versus fuel, right? So we can, it can be something that can be grown on marginal soils that wouldn't support food anyway, and this is a good solution for you know, some of our energy problems. Well, turns out that Jatropha actually can grow. It can grow quite well in um, sandy soils, but the, oil, the seeds don't produce oil. So there you go. So to produce oil, they do need good soil. They need water, just like any other crop. So we're immediately back. Obviously, we're back to kind of negotiating food versus fuel. But when I looked at this crop, when it's grown at the community level in many parts of the world, um, actually, it can be accommodated very well within community systems. So if it's small scale farming, where people are growing, say, rice or a different crop, they can grow jatropha quite effectively. And I found that women found it in general because it reduced the drudgery of work sometimes of collecting firewood. So they found it to be very effective. They also found it to be very effective actually as a cash crop. So although we see a lot of this kind of you know, imagery, which is very easy to do, right? It makes us like, you know, it's that food versus fuel. We're taking away food to run our cars. It's actually not that simple at all, right? It's, the, it's much more complicated than that. And what I did find, so that's the Jatropha tree. It's actually a really beautiful tree. Um, one of the things that I did find is that cash cropping and food crops are not as incompatible as we thought they were. So food security and cash cropping can actually be quite compatible. And we understand why in many parts of the world, they've always actually grown them together, right? The big danger is in monocropping, right? Where you reduce it to one crop, where you, you know, take away land from people, don't compensate them. That's where the trouble lies, not so much in the fact that these are actually very compatible. These crops are actually quite compatible. And I have, you know, in doing this research, one of the things that I've learned to do is, you know, a lot of orthodoxies on the left as well need to be challenged, I find, right? Because, you know, if I go into many places and say, like, you know, cash crops are actually not bad in some context for food security, I mean, they'll throw things at you, right? We know that. So uh, it's very divided. These things are very divided. So people tend to fall along these ideological lines. But if you actually do empirical work, you find that I am right, you know, and you think about women who grow rice, where you have to spend hours of the day transplanting rice in water, where you're spending time on your hands and knees often, you know, why would they not be interested in a crop where you can pluck the, um, you know, the oil seed from the tree, right? So these are things people are interested in. So I think we should remain very open to the possibility of these crops, of, of sort of more complicated narratives than we've heard, perhaps, about food security and um, in the future. So moving on. In general, if I were to organize my research in themes around the world, so if I were to say, what are the big themes that emerge in my research in terms of barriers and opportunities for women, you know, for women's you know, optimal employment in these new emerging fields, these are the ones that it's breaking out into. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of detail in each of them, but I'll try and give you a sense of what I mean by each one. So the first one. I don't think anybody will be surprised to hear that, a com that societal misperceptions of women's incompetence, you know, like lack of competence in technical occupations has been identified very frequently in the literature as an impediment for women's participation in technical fields. And definitely, the research absolutely supports it that in technical fields, you know, a woman can have, often women can have higher levels of education but, and competence, technical competence, but they're always evaluated lower than men. And we know that there's a lot of research that supports this stuff. So that, that didn't surprise me at all. I wasn't surprised by that. What I did find a bit surprising was that many of these fields, especially technical fields, you know, especially in engineering and technology, a lot of women are often, there are also misperceptions about the work involved in these fields. So what happens is that the technological aspects of these occupations get so much attention that women are often kind of, we are led, they're led to believe that these are not very socially useful. They're isolating fields. That comes up very often. This is about, these are about building things. So that, I think, to some extent sometimes explain why women are a much more significant presence, sometimes even the majority today, for example, in fields like medical, biological sciences, and in certain engineering disciplines. So if you look at biosystems engineering, environmental engineering, chemical engineering, Often, you can see, they can see how clearly their work makes a difference 
they tend to have a higher levels of participation in those fields. Um, while other fields like civil engineering, electronics engineering, and computer engineering often have fewer numbers of women. So there are variations even within the field of engineering. So what happens is that I think often women end up attributing kind of less, lower, lower status to engineering and technology occupations compared to things like health and social sciences and law, for example, where we now know that we actually have more women in you know, a lot of medical sciences and law than, um, than men. Of course, I mean, we have to be very careful that not all women aspire to be socially useful. So some may be just drawn by you know, money, prestige, other factors as everyone else. So I think it's very important also not to ascribe, obviously, very essentialist, uh, at femini you know, sort of feminized attributions to all women. What I did find interesting that is that I think generally the professional community um, in STEM fields, in engineering particularly, they often don't leverage the message that engineering is prestigious, it's well-paid, it's socially useful work. By contrast, I find that the numbers are astonishing, and we'll come back to it later in the talk, that middle-class women in a lot of emerging economies and developing countries study engineering in very large numbers, right? So it's actually far less of a barrier in many cases in, in, in a lot of non-Western contexts. And I think some of it has to do with the fact that they're perceived as very high status and well-paid occupations from the beginning, and that message is reinforced quite often. Um, one of the other things I looked at, ha pretty much had to look at, was the issue of self-employment and entrepreneurship, right? So today, I mean, we're being told that these are solutions, obviously, right? In a neoliberal climate, like, everybody needs to be entrepreneurial. How often have we heard it, right? Like, it's entrepreneurship has become this kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, you hear it everywhere. So obviously I looked at it. What I did find is that, you know, they can be, I think if there is adequate business training, if there are financial supports and social safety nets in place, then women actually do well with uh, self-employment in this sector, in renewable energy. So you, you see a lot of new uh, renewable energy things being established around the world, new businesses. At the same time, one thing that came out very, very, very clearly from my research was that generally low-income women everywhere in the world, they want stable employment. They're not interested in entrepreneurship. So the whole, we hear that, right, that entrepreneurship is for the rich. Like often people say that, people who have adequate social safety nets in place. It's definitely true everywhere in the world. And my research kind of seemed to bear it out quite well. And often, even when a lot of efforts are made, a lot of money is put into entrepreneurship, like to helping women, women in entrepreneurship. Like it's just, it's become, you hear it all the time. What, what I find is that a lot of very genuine effort is made sometimes to level the playing field, but it doesn't for the poorest women. It really can't level the playing field. So I think it's not, there's not, nothing necessarily that makes me want to say that we shouldn't encourage women to be, we should encourage everyone to be if, whatever they want to be, but I really think we have to temper it with that, that it is still something that people who are more privileged tend to be able to take on. And often I'm also very troubled by the fact that often a lot of survival activities that women perform are increasingly being classified as entrepreneurship, which gives it a whole different spin, right? Because it's, it's actually, or they're calling it survival entrepreneurship, makes me very uncomfortable because uh, you know, survival activities are being called because you don't have the option of having regular paid employment is being made to sound heroic or made, be, made to sound it's been valorized in ways that I think are quite troubling. So most importantly for me, any conversation about self-employment or entrepreneurship, we have to have a conversation about adequate social security. You know, adequate social protection for people. People have to have, you know, the idea of, for example, universal social protection you know, it's not something we should still be talking about. It's really something that should already have existed. And I say in the future, I really hope we can move to a world where, you know, social, social protection is a human right, and we should be able to disentangle it from employment status. You shouldn't only be eligible for social protection when you have employment. I think we should be able to expect social protection in any context. And if that is the case, then by all means, people can become entrepreneurs if they want to, right? Um, having said that, I mean, there are significant advancements. One of the things I want to point out is that in recent years, there's been significant advancement in strengthening social protection floors uh, around the world. So we are seeing increasingly even, quote unquote, developing countries, countries in the global south, are becoming welfare systems, right? So they're introducing a lot of new things. So for example, um, Brazil has what is called Bolsa Familia, which is a very big um, 
conditional cash transfer program where you know, some of them are conditional in the sense that you have to do certain things to receive certain amounts of money from the government. right? Others are unconditional, where you're given money and you can use it any way you want. So it's kind of these social protection schemes. Uh, so Brazil, Me Mexico have Prospera, Mali. And these are, that's why I'm using examples from the Global South. So Mali, for example, has a cash transfer initiative now where they use their you know, the welfare system essentially to provide direct cash transfers to people. India has a basic pilot income project, and then there's other, other examples. You know, Finland has tried it, the Netherlands, Scotland, Spain, Kenya, and even the United States has tried it in the past, although not now, and there's no chance of that passing now. You can, you can already guess that. But I think these are, I'm a big fan of social protection programs. I'm a big fan of universal social security because I think that Structural inequality constrains individual ability, obviously, to exercise rights and to demand entitlements, right? Of course, as I say this, Ontario has just canceled is, its basic uh, income project. If you've just noticed it, it was the Doug Ford administration. Just a few days ago, they canceled Ontario's basic income pilot project. It was not even one year in. It was supposed to be a four-year project. But to be fair, it has sparked global outrage because it goes against it's a breach of any you know, Canadian and international research ethics involving humans, right? So I think cash transfer programs can work very well and lead to a lot of innovative employment programs. But the problem is they're politically so hard to get through, right? So we've been told that you know, that whole thing about you give a person a fish and they lead for a day and you give them, you know, teach them how to fish, you know, I mean, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that the fish may be dead, the water may be polluted, right? So, um, but we're so hung up on that that I think it's very hard to see that often money actually does fix problems, right? Um, so there's very little political support for it. And depending on what kind of government you have in power, you're always going to see that kind of back and forthing of these programs. I do think they'll make a huge difference in the future. One other area that very clearly comes out in doing this research was the idea of the fact that work itself has become more precarious around the world, right? So if I'm going to look at what kinds of employment are we creating in renewable energy, I can't not talk about work in general, right? And work around the world has become more precarious. You know, ideas of um, you know, part-time work, for example, increasingly we hear that notion. So I had to understand, so although it's not just renewable energy that this applies to, I had to include it in my research because we do have to understand um, sort of if these are growing employment trends that have implications for gender equality everywhere in the world, then we do have to include it in understanding any new fields of employment, right? Because they will have, we have to analyze it within these contexts of global, global trends. Um, none of this will surprise you. You know, worldwide, the number of part time workers are men or women. Women, yeah, overwhelmingly, right? They're overwhelmingly women. And there are other very interesting things. Part-time work pays less than full-time work, even often, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting is that although while both men and women can work part-time, even for the same job in a part-time job, men get paid more than women, even in a part-time job, right? So we're talking about wage inequity at, at many, many different levels. Um, so this is obviously a huge concern. And it's, not, it's a concern because Often, it's not that women are asking for part-time employment. Now, that would be something if you actually needed certain groups of people at certain stages of life. You're doing caregiving work. You need part-time work. That's completely fine. But women actually often get, get picked up and put into part-time jobs whether or not they want it. They would rather have full-time work, but they get picked for part-time work. So it's a very important, because it's involuntary often, I think it's an issue that we really need to engage with. Um, in Canada, it's almost twice as high. So 27% of women work part-time versus only 12% of, of, of men. Um, I tried to find data specific to the renewable energy sector. What kinds of jobs are being created? Is there a difference in part-time? As you can imagine, right? Like if I can't even find data just on employment, it's very hard to find it on part-time employment. The only study I found was conducted in Spain. And it's very interesting because what they found was that women um, hold about 24%, 26% of jobs in the renewable energy sector in, in Spain, which is actually higher than the, for other industrial sectors. It's 24%, 2% higher. Then what they did find was that most jobs, 98% of jobs in renewable energy tend to be full-time. Only 2% of the jobs are part-time, but of that 2%, women hold 67% of them, right? 
So imagine this is a new, these are new fields of employment, right? So think about that, because if these are new fields of employment, you know, how quickly do they become feminized and why? Right? I don't know the answer, but I think it's a very interesting one to think about that you can build a lot of research on trying to find out why do even new fields of employment you know, become so quickly you know, feminized in that way. I think it's something that we definitely think about. Um, of course, one of the things I always say, one of the things I want to perhaps also think about is, although when we talk about part-time work, the connotation is always negative, right? Part-time work, you know, that's like a bad thing. Part-time jobs don't always have to be bad jobs. So I think we should think about that. And there's some recent research that shows that creating more part-time jobs, creating arrangements like, for example, work sharing, creating a job sharing, arrangements that, um, provided they have high wages and, and high wages and high job security, as well as things like health and pension benefits, it may actually be a, a way of restructuring work in the future, right? So having said that, and it might also be a way of creating both economic as well as environmental sustainability in the future. Having said that, I mean, since overproduction and overconsumption, particularly by the global wealthy, I mean, literally today, remains the biggest impediment for, for environmental sustainability, none of this will help. Like transitioning to green energy is not going to help if you're just going to consume more, more green products, right? So I think we have to keep an eye on that overproduction and overconsumption. But I do think that restructuring work in innovative ways in the future might help us live better. So the idea that in the future we may all be able to work less but live better has definitely been explored by a few researchers, and I do want to believe in that utopia as well, uh, I have to admit. So it's hard to imagine today when we talk about, like, there is, you know, we have in the current climate, you know, in the climate, current economic climate, it's hard to imagine. Like, will we be able to work less and live better? Like, it's a hard one to imagine. But I think there are countries that are trying. They're trying a lot of interesting things. Um, so, for example, the idea of, in North America, the idea of work time reduction where you can reduce how many hours you work from full time is actually not prevalent at all. But other countries, so for example, you know, France, um, I looked at the Netherlands, you know, there, there are very interesting innovations about how to restructure work in, in more meaningful ways. Um, the average American works about 1,900 hours per year. The average Dutch person works about 1,350 hours. So like 30% less, essentially, and, and both is considered full-time work, right? So to give you an example, so while I do agree with the potential of part-time work and with things like job sharing to promote economic security and perhaps even environmental sustainability, I'm, le I'm more ambivalent about the assertion that's been made by some scholars. So Jennifer Nadelsky, who's at U of T, she, she basically talks about part-time work for all. Actually, she's just co-written a book with Tom Mallison, who's at King's at Social Justice and the Social Justice Program at King's basically talking about how in the future we'll probably all be working part-time and that this might lead to a more equitable division of household labor between women and men, okay? So let's go there, <laughs> just in case. The assumption is based on the fact that globally women obviously do a disproportionate amount of housework, we know that, caregiving work, and today they also work outside the home, you know, often as much or often more than men, while men have not reciprocated in equal amounts in the home. That's been the, big, that's been the big debate for a long time. And it definitely is true. Everything seen, the, the data definitely supports it. So the idea that larger numbers of men will spend more time on caregiving if they work less and if they have access to flex, flexible working schedules, I think it's hopeful, but there's very little evidence to support it when we actually look at it, right? Having said that, I have to say that countries that have more equitable gender norms so if you look at Scandinavian countries, for example, they tend to have a better established tradition of flexible work policies. And of, so perhaps there is reason for optimism. So give you an example. In the US, only 27% of employers offer flex time to more than 50% of employees. By contrast, we have in Sweden, Swedish workplaces offer, 68% of Swedish workplaces offer flex time to 80% or more of their employees, which is a big difference, right? But even if such policies were in place in more countries, we'd still be left with the much more significant challenge of changing the perception of caregiving from being a burden to being something that is a deeply satisfying and important aspect of human existence. And I think that's where the big challenge is going to be. And governments can play a role. There's no question. You know, government policy is useful. They can do things like guaranteed annual incomes, living wage regulations, better labor laws. You can have 
maximum and you know, maximum working hours, minimum wage regulations. Uh, you can make sure that part-time jobs are good jobs and you actually get benefits. So governments can do that. But I think the deeper political and social consciousness required for that transformation of the intra-household gender division of labor would have to be enabled informally and socially. Right. Perhaps you know, we can have collective action, but it's not going to be happen through legal sanctions, and it's not going to happen through government action. So I think policy by itself cannot make men want to spend more time caregiving if care work continues to be perceived as low-status feminized work. And neither can policy require women to give up their control over care, particularly over the raising of children, if they've been socialized to believe that women are their, children are their primary responsibility. So until we have more transformative social sort of change take place in gender relations, I actually believe that flexible work schedules will reinforce existing gender uh, imbalances, both in employment and in care. And even the strongest proponents of this idea of part-time work, that part-time for all might improve the household gen gender division of labor, even they concede that that is true, that unless we have greater political consciousness, it's not going to happen. So those are all things to contend with. The other things that we really need to think about, if these things become a norm, then in the future, how will workers organize? How will they mobilize for their rights? So workers' unions, will we have them? Will they be relevant? You know, if part-time work, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. I generally think union coverage is much better in Canada than it is, say, the Canada and the United Kingdom has, is much better than the US. At the same time, when we look at countries like you look at Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, France, they also have very strong feminist contingents within those uh, union movements. And I think that does make a big difference because they've been, they've been able to articulate a lot of the original goals of labor movements, right? So, for example, things like delinking uh, employment status from social security. Those are all things, a lot of things have come because of very strong feminist organizing in these countries within unions. So I definitely don't want to say that unions are a thing of the, you know, you know they're all going to go by the wayside. We just don't know what will happen in the future. Whatever mode of organizing emerges in the future, I definitely hope that gender equity and social justice will remain a big component of that. Having said that, right now, the levels of unionization and new green jobs, as it were, you know, a lot of the green employment is very low to begin with. So whether in the future we're going to see new or configured models for organizing, mobilizing, and collective bargaining, you know, it, it's, at this point, it's just a matter of conjecture. We really don't know what will replace the organizing, the institutions we have today. So that's one piece. Um, the other thing I explored in a lot of detail is, um, when did I start talking? Oh my goodness, okay, well, I've been going on and on. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll try and, one of the things that I found very interesting, I'll try and wrap it up in the next, in, 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 in shortly. <laughs> so one of the things I found was that frequently one of the, in, in the kind of the mainstream literature, there's a lot about travel and mobility. Oh, you know, these jobs in renewable energy, you know, they're remote, they're, they're in locations where there's no place for families, so obviously women don't take those jobs, right? That's a very easy one. When I explored it, I kind of found, though, that, you know, there are many women who are already in jobs that don't pay well. They're in jobs that are difficult, dirty, whatever you want to call it, right? So, of course, they would work in those jobs if, you know, they were offered to them, right? So I think that because sometimes consciously or unconsciously, <laughs> A lot of these sectors, because they're so un often unintended, perhaps even, they become so male biased in their norms that even women who may be willing and able to work in some fields are not given the option to choose between you know, difficult or dangerous working conditions with low pay and difficult or dangerous working conditions with high pay, right? It's not offered to women. Instead, women are just assumed not to want to work in these jobs and they're tracked into feminized occupations you know, within these sectors even, right? Um, and to be sure, I found that women in developing countries, emerging economies, they all have challenges with managing, you know, whatever, however you want to call it, with managing their lives in terms of domestic responsibilities, work, employment, everything else. What I did find, though, is that weirdly in, in, in a lot of countries where you have extended family units, so for example, in many countries in the global south, where the extended family is the norm, right? So people live in intergenerational families, you know, ironically, that actually gives women's careers a huge boost in many cases, right? So what I did find is that in cultures where parenting is not so located in the nuclear family between two parents, 
you know, where it's the norm for grandmothers to take care of their kids, for whatever aunts and uncles to do. In those settings, I actually found that women have often have huge advantages in moving along in their careers than they do if they don't, because um, since there is often a much higher sense of collective and social parenting in many non-Western settings, women are also judged less harshly, you know, if at all, for leaving their family, children, as it were, with other family members. I mean, if I could have a dollar for every time I've been asked who I leave my son with when I travel for work, you know, it's like, it's frequent. And you kind of think, it's quite astonishing because often I'll be standing right next to my husband and I'm thinking like, who do you think I leave him with, right? To the point where I'm thinking in the future I might say that I leave him outside Terminal 3 with, you know, I don't know, $50 and a credit card. I mean, he's just turned eight years, he's eight years old, really. I mean, if that a problem, like act really surprised, right? So there is this kind of obsession that often actually you don't get in non-Western settings where family, children are raised within extended families. I just did research with uh, looking at women who work in fly-in, fly-out schedules in the north, in, the, in Northwest Territories, Nunavut, um, typically on mine sites, and mostly indigenous women. And in the literature, they're like, well, the two week in and out schedules, like horrible for women. How can women possibly manage that, you know? And, when I spoke to the women, especially to Inuit women, to indigenous women, they thought it was funny. They said, no, it's not a problem because like we, in any case, my children are cared for by, you know, a grandmother and aunt. Like that's the setting in which children are grown up. They have other problems for sure, but that was not a big problem. So there are some very counterintuitive things. Um, and many researchers and journalists have started writing about these factors in recent years. And having said that, I don't necessarily think that this is switching uh, gender roles, because even in those contexts, it's women taking care of children, right? So be that as it may, often actually there are more options that, that women have in terms of managing these issues. Um, one of the stories, uh, I remember the New York Times did a big series called the Female Factor Series, and they asked why women remain so scarce in banking in, say, places like New York and London, because they've been this year, decades and decades of struggle to try and get women to climb up the corporate ladder in these, uh, and yet they hold some of the most prestigious portfolios in India's relatively young financial industry, why women do. And one of the biggest things that emerged was that those challenges don't exist for women, especially for well-educated women from privileged backgrounds. They have lots of support, so they don't need, you know, that kind of is not as much of a challenge. Gender is not as much of a challenge, especially when you have class on your side. So it's a very counterintuitive, you know, in, in that sense finding. The other issue, moving on, um, having said that, with all of these in place, there's no denying that there are big skill and labor shortages for this industry, right, for the renewable energy industry. Everything from skilled trades, uh, architects, equipment operators, even construction laborers sometimes to work on renewable energy specific skills. So it's a challenge. At the same time, I think it's a tremendous opportunity because in countries like Canada, other industrialized countries, where, for example, women, visible minorities, uh, indigenous people, uh, people with disabilities who may have been not had opportunities in some of these sectors, there is an opportunity to create very good employment as well in these sectors, right? For that reason that there are these shortages. Um, one of the other very interesting findings from this research is I also looked at women's participation in STEM fields around the world. I looked at science, technology, engineering, and math because you hear so much about it. And the findings are extremely counterintuitive uh, because in OECD countries, we really still struggle with the numbers for women's participation in STEM. But um, unlike North America and Europe in other parts of the world, so India, China, two good examples. In China, 40% of engineers are women, which is an astonishing number. Some other numbers in the United Arab Emirates, 31%. Algeria, you know, actually 32% last number. I've even seen 40%. Mozambique, 34%, Tunisia, 40%, uh, Brunei, 42%, in Malaysia, 50% of women uh, engineers are women, in Oman, it is actually 53%, so more women than men. So what's going on there when we think about it? In Canada, we've never been able to rise above about 19%, so much so that Engineers Canada now has this big goal for 30 by 30, it's called, so basically 30% by 30 by, by year 30. And it's very interesting, there are a lot of different explanations for them. Uh, not all of them are fully satisfying. I think one they said is that in many countries where social sy support systems are weak, engineering is, such a, is, is a very good guarantee of, high, you know, of financial independence. So women will study it whether or not they're actually interested in it. So ironically, they said in countries that have better social protection systems, where the difference between studying STEM and not studying STEM is not 
as big in terms of your earnings, your quality of life, women are less likely to choose STEM. So it's, it's an ironic contradiction that countries that support gender equality more often have fewer numbers of women, which is not a fully satisfying explanation. Other people, the other explanation is that you know, if you look at global math scores, for example, of course women, I mean, you know, it, it's at par with men. There's no question about it that women can do very well in science and math. What women often also do have as a result of socialization is better verbal and better writing skills. So they tend to just go with those, often they choose those. So it's a very interesting contradiction to think about. Um, some things, for example, the example of Russia is very interesting because during the Soviet era, you know, in the USSR, 58% of women of engineers in, in the Soviet Union were women. And then since then, what you see is a gradual decline. So for example, I think I have something from 1998, it was 43%. In uh, 2002, it was 40%. And last year in Russia, it was 36%. So it's been a steady decline since the end of the Soviet Union. The same for the Baltic countries, Latvia, Estonia, uh, you know, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The exact same pattern of very high levels uh, to the point where at one point, I think at the end of the Soviet, when the Soviet Union finally you know, uh, collapsed, in Estonia, it was 68% of engineers were women, right? To down to now, it's dropping to about 30%, 20%. So I'm not using these examples because I think we need to go back to Soviet-style central planning. That's not the point at all, right? But the point is that it does make a big difference when you have good state policy supporting advancement, removing barriers for women, right? So. Uh, during the Soviet era, there were a lot of social guarantees in place, whether or not you liked them. You may not like your house, but you had a house. You may not like the childcare that was offered, but it was there, right? Which obviously was eroded significantly after the end of, um, at the end of. So we can look at a very interesting, it's kind of a scatter plot. If you look at women among STEM graduates, it's very interesting because on the x-axis, you obviously have the number of graduates. And on the y-axis is the global gender gap, right? So the higher up you are, like Finland and Norway, are very gender equitable countries, obviously, right? So the higher up on that you are, the, so, but it's ironic. So it's countries that ironically have far lower levels of gender equality, at least on the, in the measures that we use to measure gender equality, that tend to have the highest numbers of students studying STEM, right? Saudi Arabia, for example, it's a very popular choice for women engineering. United Arab Emirates, it's a very popular choice for women. Often more women than men actually choose to study engineering, which is quite astonishing when you think about. Um, so it's a very interesting kind of way about how some of this data uh, has evolved. So I think, you know, in concluding, I just want to say that one of the biggest things is I think policy intervention aimed specifically at gender equality is really important for, um, for all of these different fields. It's not enough. I mean, you know, equity doesn't just happen, right? It has to be planned. It has to be implemented. It has to be monitored and evaluated, right? And I think we're not quite doing that because when you look at, especially around, um, when we look at industrialized countries, most often the tendency has been to work on, in the global transition out of renewable uh, fossil fuels, the tendency has been to work on technology and financing. That gets a lot of attention, right? But equity doesn't get much attention because we assume all kinds of things. We assume we live in a post-gender world. We assume we live in a post-racial world. Unless, of course, you wake up and realize, like, you know, you really have to look at the data to realize that we're not, but, you know, that's kind of it, right? That there are all these assumptions that don't really hold out in practice. So I really think that that's the biggest piece. Better still, if we can move away from a lot of equity and access policies, I find, that tend to, uh, that are adopted to promote gender equity, they tend to be very linear and very positivist, you know. So they'll say things like, you know, everyone will receive consideration without discrimination on the basis of sex. I mean, you know, you know that very, very standard language that they use, it's really inadequate because it fails to address this wide range of social and institutional factors that have prevented women, that have prevented certain groups <laughs> from succeeding, and because it actually doesn't demand anything preferential for groups of people. You have to do that if you're going to correct historical and current uh, injustices, right? I mean, it's very interesting for me doing this research because even when I look at the comparison between Canada and the US, and I completely get that right now there is no federal leadership in the US for, you know, this, for some of this work, for the transition. I mean, we're talking about beautiful clean coal now so uh, in the US. So I get that, right? <laughs> Thinking of collecting data on beautiful clean coal, but anyway, uh, so 
So, but so I get that. I get that federally there's no, you know, there's an absence of leadership. Let's just say that, right? But if we look at the city level initiatives, if you look at the state level initiatives, they're actually better than the than Canada. As an example, former Obama advisor Van Jones, he has the big, what is called Green for All, which is this campaign that specifically talks about equity in green employment and creating employment for, very specifically as pathways out of poverty for you know, marginalized youth, for conversations about you know, inner city communities, for communities of color. It's very explicit language about equity, which I definitely am not beginning to see like in Canada even now. Although at the federal level, I would say, you know, obviously Canada has become like the, uh, the go-to and you know, in that sense, it's a much more interesting country and progressive country today than the US. But if you break it down and look at the state level policies and the city level policies, I would say that even the US is actually still doing more, which is quite interesting to look at. So I just like to wrap up by saying that there are similarities and differences between industrialized countries, between emerging economies, between developing countries in these patterns of women's employment. Generally speaking, there's a much larger volume of employment that is being created for women in, um, in general. A large volume of employment is being created in developing countries and emerging economies, sometimes in the context of countries that have made a switch from not having access to energy to leapfrogging directly into renewables, right? So we hear that term leapfrogging. It was used in the past to talk about cell phones, that people went from not having the land phone to having the cell phone. But it's also happening to some degree with energy. So people are moving directly onto renewables, which is creating a lot of employment, especially in the off-grid type prog programs, which is a really good thing. But I think there's tremendous additional potential for us to create good employment. But if you're going to talk about gender equity, though, we really do need more transformative shifts in societal attitudes about gender roles. And we need that everywhere, not just in developing countries and emerging economies. We need it in, in, in industrialized countries as well. As well, when I do this research, I always like to point out that although this is a topic of research that I find very interesting and that I have taken on, you know, wanting to study sustainability, wanting to study sustainable occupations, I really feel that we also need to pay, we need to be very concerned about fields in which women are completely undervalued and underpaid, in which they are already the majority. So I'm talking about things like childhood education, like primary education, social work, health, library services. And these are already fields that are green, in a sense, right? So we need to be paying attention to them as well. So I would say that um, I remember Linda Hirschman, who is a very, you know, she comments a lot on women and work type of stuff. She's a lawyer. She once wrote an op-ed at the height of the economic recession in the US. And um, I kind of, uh, she basically said, maybe it would be a better world if more women became engineers and construction workers, but programs encouraging women to pursue engineering have existed for decades without having much success, at least in the US. At the moment, teachers and childcare workers need to support themselves. Many are their families as sole support. So let's not forget that. So I think while we can pay attention to improving, improving the status, improving the wages and working conditions for people working in feminized sectors, I think is, such as the ones that I talked about, are as important as paying attention to women's participation in these well-compensated fields that have historically not been open to women. So it's, I don't want to make it sound as if now we're encouraging women to move into these fields. I think we need to pay attention to the other side of the, of the equation as well. Um, I do lots of, I produce these animated videos that talk about findings from this research. Um, so, um, you know, just to share findings, I've done lots of peer-reviewed papers, working papers, um, op-eds about these topics. And I feel very fortunate. I think I should do a funding acknowledgement for sure because I've had lots of really, really good support for this research. Some of it has been directly for research. So Western, Shirk, both Insight and Knowledge Synthesis Grants, the Indo-Canadian, the Shastri Institute, you know, has given me money to do empirical work in India. Uh, the UN, well, FAO, ICARDA have both supported the research on biofuels because it's, you know, agriculture technically, you know. Global Affairs, IRENA, and IEA have really supported my work through like knowledge translation work. So I would really like to acknowledge uh, these, these funders. Um, I also want to say for students, I really think that there is so much need for good evidence in some of these fields. And there are things that are wide open where there's no evidence, right? So uh, I don't necessarily want to take you away from the fields that you're interested in. But 
if you are interested in these issues, there's so much need for good empirical work, for good empirical analysis, because otherwise, you know, the big danger is that if we don't have empirical evidence, then a lot of times policy gets made based on either ideology or intuition, right? So it's only when we actually have the data that we can speak against that, and we can say, no, this is what we are finding, actually, so we need to pay attention to these issues. So if you're undecided, looking for things to do with your future, definitely keep this um, area of research in general in mind. There are lots of opportunities in it. Thank you very much. Oh, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone has a question? Sure. I'll just start with the lady up there. Yeah, go ahead. And the way to sign with uh, a shared leadership is Andrew Castleton. Okay. Um, and you have made a point about um, the need for evidence based work. But you also said that data sets are very limited. Mm -hmm. That's, that is very much the contradiction of doing this research is having to do it, right? So like when I realized at that meeting, like I talked about the woman and work in a warming world, I realized that he wasn't being dismissive of my question. It's that we don't know, like we need to know more about what types of jobs you're producing. So there is a real need for primary data, really good primary data, which is why I try to create it. And I think there's lots more room for this kind of evidence building. So if you were to look at the late, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the Stats Canada data set mm -hmm. survey. Yeah, were, yeah. Uh, NOC21, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. the one that includes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that not have very good data on renewable energy? It, you know, the biggest problem with Stats Can data is we haven't even been able to convince them to disaggregate between the natural resources sectors. So for example, energy and mining gets reported together. Right, so there are real limitations we can collect. So we've actually reported that to StatsCan quite a bit because I look at their data and it's like I can't even distinguish between, let alone whether it's renewable energy or say oil and gas. And, and in Canada, you know, like a lot of people, again, they think that eventually we'll move out of renewables or we'll move out of fossil fuels and into renewables. Right now it's this, that and everything. We're actually developing everything. I mean, you know, the pipelines are continuing, oil sands, and I think this is true for countries that have large reserves of fossil fuels, that we are going to go for them. Like there's just, uh, we shouldn't have to. The analogy I always use is when people say, oh, but you know, eventually we'll run out, so we'll have to move, we'll have to transition to renewables. And the analogy I always use is, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, right? It ended because we found better tools, because we designed better tools. So it's the same thing, the better, the better tools already exist. We already know that renewable energy exists. We already know that we can do this. We can also do it cheaply, actually. We can do it for far less than before. The prices have dropped. So I think what's preventing us is political because there's been so much money sunk into fossil fuels, right? Into the research, into the advocacy, into the lobbying. So that's what makes it so hard to go up against, which is why we see these very contradictory tendencies within Canada in terms of our energy policies, like, is all over the place. It's actually quite funny sometimes. Because in the same week, you'll hear things that are being announced that are you know, quite contradictory. So that's kind of what the picture looks like. Sorry, there's another question at the front there. Eric? Oh, hi. Thank, that was great. I feel like I learned so much today. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you have noticed, in looking at the trends around the countries that you looked at, yeah, yeah. Um, do you see similar patterns in terms of the language around gender discrimination? Like very good question. Women. Yeah. It, it's so interesting to me that there's not much progress being made wherever you look. I'm yeah. just wondering if the patterns are the same around what makes that possible. It's, it's a very good question, and I've actually answered this before. One of the ironic things is that countries that have, you know, so in Canada, you would think that if I'm doing research on a topic like this, that people would be very receptive to it. I mean, we are progressive and all that, right? So, uh, and that they would be this a fair bit of resistance. People have said things to me like, oh, but there are more women who go to university now than men, right? So, so it's, there are all these sort of like assumptions about being post-gender, right? And they're like, oh, it's men we really need to look out for in Canada. I mean, you know, there's th that kind of thing you hear it all the time. But when I say, yeah, you know, I understand that in terms of the actual numbers, we do have now 
you know, the university going population is more, there are more women than men. It's true, right? But when you, but the big gap happens with employment, right? With, and with fields of study, right? So when you parse it down like that, I, I've actually found far less resistance to this research outside of Canada, often in quote unquote countries in the global south, because there's, there's no denial there about the fact that these are issues we need to be paying attention to. Does that make sense? So I found far more equity-based initiatives, especially things that consider gender. I found them to be more prevalent outside of the OECD context, where people will actually not have any denial about it, right? Whereas I find that in the EU, in, in North America in general, there's this counter discourse that this is all done, really. We don't need to be worrying about things like employment for women. In fact, it's men. Like, I've had that repeated to me multiple times we need to be worried about, right? Uh, so it's interesting, I think, that, yeah. So I find that to be a very interesting trend. And it's very uneven. So that's my point, right? It's not that I think Saudi Arabia is terrific for women, not at all. That's not my point. But the map of who studies what, like, they're very, very counterintuitive that you have more women than men studying engineering in Saudi Arabia or in Oman, right? So I, the, it, it, there's, there's very little that's intuitive when you do this research, when you're, your findings are kind of all over the place. But there's more denial about uh, the existence of uh, gender inequity, I find, in the OECD context, because I think people think we've made so much progress, this is not something we need to be talking about anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, I get that a lot. Yeah. This is, uh, I'm not quite sure how to frame this question, but I'm curious about the interplay between the pace of the transition mm -hmm. to renewable resources yeah. and then the sort of, both the opportunity and the pace of changes in employment. So the opportunity to try to shape it from a policy point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, you mentioned that there are some cases where you might have countries leapfrogging into renewable yeah, resources. Yeah, yeah. That seems very different than, you know, in a developed country where you're Absolutely. trying to maybe, yeah. you know, uh, remake the grid so mm -hmm, that people mm -hmm. can have renewable mm -hmm. uh, resources feeding into the grid and so on. So, and also, do you think that the pace is accelerating? And is this the kind of thing that, um, you know, between 2020 and 2030, we'll have a much more rapid development of renewable resources? Or is there still, is it still going to be sort of a long, slow runway? I want to say long, slow runway because so much of it, like it's, you make these huge advancements at the same time you hear these very contradictory developments. And I completely agree with you. One of the biggest challenges in the industri industrialized country contract is that we have so much infrastructure that's already in place. What are we going to do with it, it's right? All so yeah, right. Yeah. It's all fossil yeah. and the political lobbies that go with it. The kind of money that's been put into the kind of subsidies we're still yeah. offering, right? Like uh, fossil fuels. If those were removed from fossil fuels and put into renewables. It'd be done, right? But it's yeah. not happening. So people also don't get those points very well. I mean, what you pay at the pump for fossil fuels, it's not reflective of the cost of fuel at all, right? Because there's decades and decades of research money that's gone into it, subsidies that go into it, right? Mm -hmm. That renewable energy is still needs. It still needs that support. It needs support for research and development. It needs subsidies. That is, and it's nowhere near at par because the political lobbies are such that they're so weighed in favor of fossil fuels, right? So right. that's what makes it much more tricky. So in context where that kind of lobby didn't exist or where it was not as powerful, obviously right. the transition is happening faster. Right. Does that right. make sense? And then, so part of the, the other question I wanted to ask is uh, how does that pace relate to the possibilities for changing the conditions of employment in this sector so that you can enhance gender equity and have other goals? So if the I mean, if we have a long, slow runway, is it possible that we actually have more time to try to shape the nature of employment in this sector? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I kind of don't know. Like, I, I really don't know. Like, there are so many moving parts to this stuff, and, it, mm -hmm. and things change so fast that, um, like, some countries are astonishing. I mean, Costa Rica, it, now it's like more than 90% of their energy is renewable. Like, you know, oh, wow. like, how did Costa Rica do that, right? <laughs> So there are these very, very interesting examples of, but this is also a country that decided it doesn't need a military and gave it up years ago, right? Like, so th there are all these things that make it, make it very, very interesting. But I do think that having fossil fuels like Canada does, it's a huge liability, I'll say, right? Because it's very, very, you can't make that lobby angry. 
Like, as a politician, you can't do it without, you know, basically risking re-election, right? So they always figure out ways of, you know, if you just think about the way Justin Trudeau has gone about it, right? It's so... Um, I don't even know what to call it. It's like a bit of everything, and you try and you understand why, right? Because he's trying so hard to keep so many constituencies happy, um, and thus the kind of anger and um, fear, even if, when you look at Alberta, right? With the with kind of like what happened with the oil sands and the oil sand workers. So there is that. I think that makes it actually the transition harder. But perhaps it, you know, and even the policy making, that's why, is complicated by all of that. Because if you don't even believe that there's a problem with something, why would you be motivated to do anything about it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Complicated by the fact that we have all these delusions about being post-racial and post-gender and post-everything. Right. 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 So I think that's what, the, that's kind of the piece, the picture. saying is that we're not fearful enough in terms of the environmental disasters that's happened. Right? That doesn't seem to have any type of motivating initiative to get I, people moving. I mean, there are people still saying that it has nothing to do with climate. And I just don't, kind of don't understand, right, like how it's even possible to believe that. And I think Canadians all come out and say it, and it's being recorded, great. I know. They care about the environment, but they don't actually care that much. Is that fair? I think it is fair, right? So I think it is fair. That's why when you see liberal governments, they come in and they want to do certain things, but they're very cautious about how to walk that line because they're so fearful. And losing jobs, I mean, that's just the biggest one, right? And, and there's uh, added to that, you have the whole discourse about automation happening, disruptive technologies, automation, and the kind of fear-mongering around it is really quite interesting. Like in the future, I want to do a project specifically looking at gender equity and, and, and disruptive technologies and automation because... At the end of the day, some jobs will be lost, there's no question about it, but there'll always be work. So it's in planning how to basically prepare the workforce for coming automation. And countries that ironically have the highest levels of automation, so if you look at, say, Germany, for example, often have fairly low levels of unemployment, which means that there's no correlation, right? But the fear-mongering can be done so easily about things like automation as well. So I think that's part of the problem. But I do think that unless there is an explicit effort to talk about equity, it just doesn't happen. Because why would it happen, right? One of the trends we are seeing in Canada now is that a lot of that the people who are best informed about the transition from fossil fuels to, to renewables are people who are in the fossil fuel industry. They can see the writing on the wall. They've known for a long time that these are industries that are not going to survive. So you hear about like oil and gas workers you know, leaving and joining, taking up renewable energy. They're joining faster, earlier, in far bigger numbers because they know the writing on the wall, right? And given that that workforce was predominantly male, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you don't do anything about it, that workforce is going to move over, right? And we're going to close off, again, opportunities. So I think at the end of the day, Equity really just doesn't happen by itself. It has to be planned, monitored, evaluated, you know? Um, and that conversation, I think the priority is not high enough in, in, in OECD countries because the focus has remained on just the technology and the financing and the technology, that's all, you know? Like, I'll look at huge reports about Canada's renewable energy future and find, like, no mention of equity in the documents often. Like nothing, not even a reference in passing, right? Even the organizations that take a lot of pride in doing this work, like I do think that, like Federation of Canadian Municipalities, I think they do really good work. I think that there are fairly progressive organizations working on environmental sustainability, but even they have focused, they focus on job creation. That's like, that's all over the place, right? They talk about job creation a lot, but very little about specifically about equity in that conversation because it's deemed to not be necessary even though obviously the findings tell us something quite different. So. Can I ask another? Yeah, so the yeah. thinking about um, unions in the tech sector, yeah. so the renewable energy sector seems to actually cut across a bunch of different yeah. sort of industry, yeah. tech, agriculture. Mm -hmm. So the, it isn't quite clear where to place it. But I mean, I've always heard, and I might not, I don't have the evidence to back this up, so it might yeah, not yeah. be correct, but the unions have been quite weak in the tech sector, like IT and computers. And so I'm wondering how, uh, whether unions can play a role and whether they've played a positive role in pushing for equity in, reno in the renewable sector 
my answer is no. Like most employment that's been, and you're completely right, right? Like the tech sector was a good example of a sector that's not well unionized at mm -hmm. all. Uh, so I think if there are public sector jobs in RE, then yeah, you know, you will see, like you, you'll see fairly high levels of unioniza unionization. And Canada actually is fairly high compared to other OECD countries in terms of uh, unionization. Mm -hmm. And women, actually more women have unionized jobs in Canada, which is again, very unusual for other OECD countries. But that's because the public service has increasingly become you know, feminized, right, in Canada. So, uh, but the tech sector, they haven't, and part of it is that challenge because the jobs exist in so many different sectors of employment, right? So installations, manufacturing, fuel, like there's so many different things. And I'm not convinced that unions are the future. Again, I'll get killed in some places for saying that, but I'm really not convinced because the history of how unions have taken on gender issues is pretty depressing as well, right? So unions have been, you know, often dismissive outright of like any women's issues, of issues of gender equity. So I'm not conf confident that we need to, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater as it were. I understand the value of unionizing and organizing, but in the future, I think we might need to see new models. I'm not sure what they will look like and we definitely need them. Uh, but that is just something, again, that I think we could look at in very interesting ways. And the unions that impress me the most are the ones that have always had very big social justice, you know, like uh, feminist traditions within them. So there, those issues are very high profile, but that's because people have historically worked very hard on those issues, right? So um, I kind of don't know about the, f I don't think unions as a mode of organizing will serve this sector well in the future. We might need some other new modes of, I don't know, Uber union, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. You know, we have so much of it as today. Like we were talking about, just the, just, just the way that work has changed is so interesting. So, yeah. More questions? Thank you. Well, on this. Thanks Thank very you. much. <laughs>